Oké, okay. uh, goedenavond en welkom op de volgende webinar rond de rugby spelregels. Deze avond gaan we het hebben over de tackle en de ruk die daarop volgt. Uh, maar vandaag ga ik het woord laten aan uh, twee andere mensen, maar misschien even kort nog de afspraken voor deze avond. De webinar zal eindigen tegen 9 uur. Onze micro en video staat uit. Eventuele vragen kunnen altijd gesteld worden via de chat, in het Nederlands, Engels of Frans, geen probleem. En deze webinar wordt opgenomen en zal nadien ter beschikking gesteld worden voor degenen die dat wensen. En dan laat ik het woord nu aan John en Philippe en zij zullen zich kort zelf voorstellen. Hello, it's us again. Good evening, everyone. It's good our uh, third webinar. Good evening, John. After uh, the, the scrum, after the line out, I think it's time to speak about what happens around 170 to 200 times per game and still generating a lot of discussion. The tackle and rock. So, a small video to see what we're going to talk about, and we'll see each other just after that. Excellent. So the first time we were with Michel and myself, second webinar is with Johnny, and tonight we have the pleasure to meet John. So good evening, John. Good evening, Philippe. Good evening, everyone. John, it's nice to have you tonight because we, we've, you have been held in several positions. You have been a player, you've been a coach, and you're still an acting, uh, an acting coach, and you have been as well an international referee. You're still a referee in, in rugby Europe. Uh, so we're going to be able to have all the different perspectives with you tonight and the different uh, and the different vision. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting to uh, analyze rugby uh, through uh, all those perspectives as a player first and then uh, now uh, as a coach and um, and a referee because uh, certainly tackle and a rock situation they generate a lot of uh, question and frustration and. Um, a referee needs to, to deal with the frustration of the player and the frustration uh, of a coach. So it's very important to, uh, for everyone to understand what, uh, how we analyze a situation as a tackle or as a ruck, and then to understand why uh, sometimes we take that kind of decision, like uh, let go, or why sometimes we decide to, to whistle. Excellent. So, so I, we've I seen that on... on a the base, let's dive into the, the substance. We've seen during the, the webinar about the scrum that we had this idea of a picture which set the scene of anything we want to see. Uh, can you tell us, if you, is it the same thing around the, the tackle, first of all, uh, to start us with? Are you processing the, the same uh, concept of picture uh, on your in order in order to to be able to deal with all these multiple and uh, numerous situations in the game, this is absolutely necessary. As for the tech, uh, as for the scrum and for the line out, we need to have a picture because we have to we need to have some reference to analyze all the situation. I will first say that um, if you compare uh, the picture of a tackle of rock and the picture of scrum and line out. What is very different is the fact that uh, scrum, you have maybe 18, 20, 22 scrums, maybe line out with 14 in a game. And those are static pictures. So that means that you can take your time to analyze the situation, to be placed the, the, where you want to be uh, standing around the, the scrum or where in the line out, in front or at the back. So you can take the time. With the tackle and the rug situation, it is totally different. 
because as you said, it's maybe 170 or 200 tackle and rock situation during the game. So it's permanently during the game, you, you have to, to analyze the situation and also it's moving. So sometimes you are behind, sometimes you are left side, sometimes you are right side, sometimes you have some movement, uh, moving players uh, on your way. So it's, you, you must have a picture as a reference but it's difficult to consent to the same picture. So your, your picture will depend the place you stand, how many players are involved in the rock situation, is it quick, is it slow? So you have to adapt yourself. But of course, we need to make reference to a picture. Uh, we, we can see on this picture here, it's, I think it's illustrating a bit the complexity of this, of this phase. And as you said, there are, okay, the repetition quite a lot. And you said that there are many actors participating about that. Do you have some tricks to try to identify all of them depending and, and then associate a, a role and responsibility to, to yes. each of it, uh, these actors? Actors is or attack or defense. So we have to analyze uh, in a kind of um, uh, in, in a timeline, which has which responsibility the first and then how come the responsibilities after it? So we have tackler, tacklers and assistant tacklers. So what they do is the same. So an assistant tackler, and sometimes players don't understand that. And sometimes it's also difficult <coughs> for coaches to hear, but what an assistant tackler does, is the same thing as a tackler. And he has the same responsibilities. So this is the first actor is tackler and assistant tackler. Then you have the ball carrier, and here's the question, John. Uh, you said a tackler and assistant tackler; they have the same responsibility. But how do you differentiate them in, in the face? Because they don't have the same behavior, I guess. Um, but they, in my timeline, is the first actor. So what what we will see first of all is the duties of the tackler. So he needs to release and he needs to roll away. And, and the, the tackler is the one that goes to the ground. Huh? That goes to the ground. But the assistant tackler helps the ball carrier to go to the ground. So he's joining the movement. And he can be just with the shoulder or with his arm on the, on the back of the ball carrier. He has the same duty. So he must also uh, release and also uh, roll away if it goes on the ground. So this is the first um, uh, responsibility. It's assist, uh, tackler and assistant tackler. So an, the tackler goes to the ground, the assistant stays on his feet, but they both have to uh, have really? the same responsibility when they act. Okay. Yes, this is number one in the timeline. We analyze what they do if they release. Okay. So it's like a little check. If they if they brought on the on the ground, so they tackle and then they release and roll away for the tackler. It's like all right, check on the checklist. Now we are going to look what is the ball carrier doing. Because also he has to, he has the time to place the ball, to remove the ball, all right? So he can't hold the ball. And this is the second one. So in the checklist, if you see the tackler or the assistant tackler staying with his hand on the ball and never release, I won't even look at what does the ball carrier because he can't act if he is not free of playing the ball. So it's like I said, it's a timeline, first tackler, assistant tackler. If it's check, now we see what the ball carrier does. Does he free the ball? Does he place the ball? All right, second check. And now we are going to look at what does the other players do? And we call that the, the support, okay? Or the arriving players. Uh, a little memory trick. <laughs> we we learn that to the young referees, but it helps all the time. Mm -hmm. It's called TATA, T-A-T-A. -T -A. So it's T for tackler, A for assistant tackler, then um, T for tackle player, and then A for arriving players. And this is the timeline that will guide us, that will help us on all the tackle situation to see which player does the first infringement. Because of course, you will see in many games, if it takes a long time, you have a tackler, you, you have a tackler situation, and then you have some support, it becomes a rock. And then you have 
uh, not releasing and you have players arriving on the side, you have a hand in the rug, so it's a whole messy. But the referee needs to see which actor did the first infringement. And to help him with that, he comes back to his frame or to his timeline with his tata, tackler, assistant tackler, tackle player, and arriving players. So I think it's clear now we have the, the, the picture. What I think it's extremely difficult is that you need to repeat this exercise during 80 minutes with all the faces, with potentially being a, a bit of tiredness, a physical uh, reduction, a, a lack of lucidity, but still you need to be coherent, consistent, and have this idea of continuity. So do, do you train for that? Do you, are there any trick, in fact, to ensure that you, you keep this coherence and consistency? Because that's what the, the coach is and that's what the public is expecting on, on the other side. What you penalize on the right side, you need to be able to be penalize it on the other side all along the game. Do you train for that? The best training first is physical condition for referee. Because if you are too far of the breakdown situation, you can't see mm. what happens in the first time. You can't see, if you can't see the ball, if you can't see the ball carrier and you can't see what the tackler of the assistant tackler do, you, you will take a, a wrong decision. So the first training will be uh, physical condition and you almost must be on the same time close to the players when the breakdown happens. Because uh, you, you, you said a word that's very important for us, for the players and for the coach, which is continuity. If you're there on the breakdown situation and you see uh, infringement coming, you can prevent that infringement by communication, by telling the players, no, or release, or yeah. roll away. Or you, so you can have the situation going on and you can prevent uh, an infringement so you can have some continuity. <laughs> I said a lot to the players sometimes when they I don't understand why I whistle. You know, we're not paid by the number of penalties we give. We don't like giving penalties. If we can prevent all the penalties and we can very little numbers of penalties on the game, that means that we have a good physical condition because we were there on the breakdown situation. We can help the players not doing infringement and so we can help the game going on, which is all the purpose of a referee it's helping the game going on. Okay, thanks. So, and I guess we are, you are as well uh, referring to this notion of clear and obvious that we hear in all the webinar. Uh, let, let's move a bit, a bit to, the, to the law. And uh, so that summarizes a bit what you said is that the different actors, we have a, a, a tackler. So it's the one who's holding the player, the ball carrier and going to the ground. Mm -hmm. We have the tackled player with the one, the ball carrier that goes to the ground, and this famous assistant that sometimes you hear a lot of the, the public shouting, but he is the tackler and etc. He cannot do that. Well, the assistant has role and responsibilities, but he's, as he's not on the ground, he's on his feet, and if he's on the good side, can, uh, if he respects the, the engagement rules, can still go and contest the ball. So I, I think it's very clear now we, we have with this Tata perspective, we have been able to identify the, the different actors. He is, he, is, he is the kind of actor, and we'll see that a uh, little bit later on, that will change name from assistant tackler. He can become a jackler. Yeah, exactly. So now we move into uh, directly the, the first one. We, uh, let's speak a bit uh, about the, the tackle itself and the priority on what you are looking at. We've had recently, again, some uh, in, uh, explanation and uh, action requirement from World Rugby with these three points. And you just indicated us, you told us that uh, the role of the responsibility from the uh, tackled player, from the assistant, but the first one you said you will look at is the tackler, correct? Yeah, let's play on maybe the video. So, we, and, uh... we, so these are the three one. I remember you said the tackler must release, so let's have a look at the video. Yeah, so that we have Rasha Mbadambi with the tackle. Penalty. This is tackler. Penalty in Namibia. So very important to hear what the French referee said. He called assist. Exactly yeah, yeah. as you mentioned, the assistant must clearly release before acting. Yeah. 
that was the number three here was assistant tackler. And so we can call an assistant tackler a tackler because he has the same duties. He must release the player. Even if he stays on his feet and then he will become the juggler, he needs to release clearly the ball and the ball carrier so he can try to move on and uh, it helps the ball staying alive, in fact. So we can have some continuity. So you see here that the, the lady there, she, she stayed too long with her hands on the ball so she, because she wanted to slow down, of course, the movement. She, she saw the, the game was on and very quick. And with the fact that she, she leaves her hands on the ball, she wants to slow down the, the game. By slowing down the game, the defense can be ready for the next phase. And that's how they can contest. Yeah. I think we'll discuss after because otherwise we have difficulty to hear you. We'll talk after that because I have several questions for you and uh, we can hardly hear you when the, the, comment, the comments are on. So here we've seen several things. Uh, can, can you tell us a few things what, on what you mentioned about communication? Indeed, as you explained, we've seen it that in some of the phases, the referee will still try to give a chance to the phase to happen. And if not, he, he, he will then, or he or she will then sanction how do you manage this communication? How do you see it? As a referee, we must understand what the players want to do. Of course, they are very enthusiastic. And the players, they, they not always play with the, the low book in their pocket or in their mind. They are there in the face. They are engaged. They are strong on the tackle. It's, they engage their whole body and the, they all strength to tackle or to contest the ball. And so sometimes they are so enthusiastic in their, their movement that they forget that their first duty is to roll away or to release. And so a little word like release from the referee. And if you have a smart player that list, who listens, he will say, oh yes, my duty is to release. And so it takes less than one second for him to release the situation. And so the ball will get free and we have no slowing down situation and we can have continuity. So it has to be smart from the referee. It has to be smart from the players. That's, um, we have to, to work together. It's not the referee against the players. It's the referee who must work with the players. And if he sees that a player that was so strong in the tackle, you know, you bring a strong player down on the floor, maybe he needs to rest a second bef before moving. And so he doesn't do that on purpose. Sometimes he does, of course. But if you say a little work like release or roll away, it helps them to remind. And if he moves quickly, okay, reward him and let the ball go. Don't give a penalty. We, we, course, hear, so, uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, now we hear sometimes just referee uh, uh, talking a lot, speaking on each faces, and some, notably at high level, who don't speak at all. You, as a player, how reactive were you to a referee possibly who was systematically speaking in all the phases? Have you come to a point that at the end you just don't listen anymore? Yeah. Um, sometimes you, you have players who ask you, oh, so you will tell on each breakdown uh, release or you will Actually, say when yes. it's a rock? And I say, no, I don't have. We, if we want, we don't have to speak at all. We only can whistle if, if we decide that it will be a, a uh, not the best idea because otherwise we lose the contact and the working together with the players. So we have to balance uh, the situation where we need, when we see that they need our help. And probably when we come close from the try line and everything begins more intense, the impacts are so intense that the players, they're so tired when they come on the, on the ground that on that very moment, they need a little help to say roll away or release. So they, they see that we want the continuity of the game. Yeah. So it's a balance. I must say, uh, when it's quick game in the open, in the open game from 2020 to 22, uh, you don't need to talk. But when it comes more intense on difficult phases, there the referee must be very close from the, from the breakdown situation and try to communicate if you realize that it will help the players. OK. Michel, if you have questions on the chat, because I don't see it, please feel free to intervene anytime. I have no problem with that. That would be nice. 
I will uh, keep you informed if there are any questions coming in. But for the moment being, there are no questions. That means that we are interesting. So let's move to the second one. So the tackler must release. And you have the second perspective is that he must roll away. And we will explain how to roll away out of a tackle phase. From the Japanese, they stopped the driving line out. We see Rafael there clearly doesn't roll away, makes no effort to roll away after the tackle, and it's an easy decision for Nigel Owens. Quick pull there from Nagade. It's a go to cross the line. Trying to skip back in field there is Sakate. Advantage to slow. Advantage for Japan. They'll go back for the penalty. Never been a play though. Japan immediately quick up the starting blocks, moving that ball around smartly. Samaya a little slow to get away from the breakdown. I think it's. Uh, I know already the question that some players would ask is that. Why do you penalize a player that technic technically cannot move away because he has two or three other guys on his back? And uh, some of them are doing some gesture to try to show the referee that they are making an effort, but still we are penalizing them. Why, why do we do that, John? Sometimes it's bad luck. And most of the time when a player is stuck on the wrong side and he can't move, it's most of the time not of, not of his fault. He's there and then he has all his friends' support who bring him into that situation where he can't move. Mm -hmm. And so it's bad luck. And so how we do analyze that? We have to see what that's slowing down. The, the, so the, the ball is stuck in the, in, in the breakdown or in the ruck, okay? The ball can't move because of the player. But he's trying to move but the ball is not free immediately. We have to analyze if that situation has an impact on the game or not, I would say. If the attack was already ready to play fast mm -hmm. and the defense was not ready, and so the attack could go through the defense, then of course, we have to penalize the situation because even if it's not his fault, he has slowed down the, the, the ball and so the attack has no more op opportunity to, to go through the defense. If there is no um, uh, impact, like the ball is stuck, but the attack is not ready, there is no extra movement. So we can leave some seconds for the players to move on, and then the ball will be free, and then the attacking team can play. So it's about, it's about if it has some influence on the game, if the defense is ready or not, if the attack is ready or not. And so from the influence, uh, we decide if we penalize or not. So you will contextualize, in fact, your interpretation of the of impact of the, every, the of every decision. You must understand that we have maybe 200 tackles on the, on the game. Every single tackle, every single breakdown situation is analyzed through a context where we are on the field. Um, how many players are involved? Is it a quick game? Is it a slow game? Um, because it's the context to bring us the information. Mm -hmm. So just one technical precision, if we are player or coaches that are watching uh, tonight, what we expect as well is that the guy who is uh, leaving, the tackler uh, that is uh, leaving, who is leaving the, the tackle phase has to do it from the side, naturally. Because if he comes from the, in, in the axis, he will certainly... Uh, penalize who block the, the number nine uh, of the possession uh, in his action to relay. So we are expecting the player to leave from the side. Let's have a look on the, on the third video if you want and we discuss then afterwards. We, we, have, a, we have a question. We have a question coming in from uh, Hervé. Uh, what about ball carrier holding the tackler? Any trick to identify this? Ah. 
those are it can be a difficult situation to to watch it depends if you can watch this if you can watch of course the the the, the ball carrier who, who holds who grabs the tackler to try to get a penalty of course then you can say a release anyway and if we see that he does the fourth you can penalize him but of course it's a kind of situation that may may be difficult to to see because it okay it's kind of cheating from the uh, ball carrier sometimes if you see that you must take it immediately because it's not um, in the right way of playing rugby if you don't see it we're sorry for the player but uh, uh, we will probably penalize the the wrong player it can happen okay uh, another question from uh, davide what is the recommended direction for rolling away and and, and should we sanction if if done differently <laughs> i had a, i had a very good experience of um, it was a situation i won't say the the teams i hope maybe the players will recognize it himself um, it was a kind of a situation breakdown situation coming close from the try line and uh, so one player was kind of slow and i say roll away move move and the way he decided to move was to to be in the way of the the scrum half on his way to take the ball he said i'm moving i'm moving but of course the direction he decided to take was to to be even more in the way of the scrum half, so to slow down even more the ball. So I penalize him for that. So uh, what is the purpose of running away? Is to free a ball and to get the next time of, of game. This is the purpose. So if you say roll away and the ball gets free and you can play immediately, that means that he has free the ball and roll away in the right direction. If his movement avoids even more the ball to get free then you penalize him so we don't have any recommendation of he has to turn right or he has to turn left or he must go through no every single situation will be different but you must you must analyze what will be the consequences of his movement does it free the ball immediately thank you very much we can go with the continuity does it avoid even more the ball to get free i penalize immediately because he did it on purpose to slow the ball or accidentally That can yeah. I don't believe in accidentally. <laughs> Allez, let, let's let's move forward. Thanks, Michel, with uh, with the next video. If he wants to go, uh, you played it already, so yeah, maybe you have to go to the next and then come back. Philippe, de, yeah. Jones rings the changes and here they go. Gangs of the great ball. Cruz in support. Big turnover for Marcel Crafty. Tamura goes. Salafoa. Your body speed, you might turn over. Turnover there for Japan. Test try number 23 for Bogoracha. It's a game, it's a brilliant turnover on the, on the ground. Barcelona. Dummy there from PC over the halfway line. Over that one there is Pierre Manny. Oh, yeah, doesn't have a look yet. Pierre Manny getting over this one. Second rugby world cup for the video. Okay, So, John, we have seen here some situation, and uh, I'd like to raise just one point with you. Uh, naturally, some of the turnover, the guy who is turning the ball over, so what we call the jackler, is not systematically absolutely perfect uh, on his body position. Uh, we have seen the Japanese that was completely on the ground, but still being allowed to turn the ball. Do you, as a referee, appreciate, and as an ex-player or, or a coach, do you appreciate and, and let go such nice movement, which could technically always be penalized? But I mean, here is all this referee have rewarded still the, the great effort from the jackler to come and take the ball. I think when it's well done, we must re reward uh, um, a good changing of ball uh, situation. 
Because rugby, it's a team sport. That means that you never let your, uh, the ball carrier alone. It's a sport where the support is very important. And if in the tackle situation, the support is too far and the tackler has the opportunity to tackle, to release, and then to contest the ball. And he does that in the laws with a good spirit, with the time to release the ball. And then to, he takes the ball. Of course, you must reward him because it's, it's kind of the fault of the support who was too far. Or maybe the ball carrier, he decided to move too far and he get far of his support. Or maybe his support was too, too slow. But anyway, if a jackler, a, ta a tackler or assistant tackler, he does that correctly, he brings on the ground, he releases and then grabs the ball. Of course, we must reward that because it's one player against all the support that comes. And if technically, technically he has the opportunity to take it, this is fantastic because otherwise, the only chances you have to contest the ball in rugby will be the scrum of the line out. Mm. And, and this would be so, so boring. So touch and uh, scrum and line out, of course, are very important to contest the ball. But every breakdown, 180 or maybe 200 situation in the game can be a situation of contesting the ball and try to get back the mm -hmm. ball too. So I think when it's done correctly, you must reward it, of course. Okay, thanks. So I think we've heard a lot about the, the, the tackle. I think it's uh, time now to, uh, to know how to use a PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, Phil, uh, I would like um, to, to. I want to, to give another word about. Um, uh, you, you asked me uh, how we decide uh, what is important for coach and for the players will be of, to be coherent as a referee. So, if we referee the blues on a certain way, we must referee the red on the same way. That can be on the ruck, on the tackle, on the turnover situation. If we give the opportunity for the blues. To, to turn over, we must give the same kind of opportunities for the red. So but the referee must be coherent about his decision. And okay. he must be consistent all the game because players are very smart. They will take the five first minute of the game to analyze how the referee whistle on, on breakdown situation. Does he give a little time? Is he ref, uh, whistling very quick? So then they will adapt the game and the support on how we whistle. So from that very moment, we must be consistent on our decision or the game. So by example, what we can do is to give time to, uh, for the support to come, but on the three last minutes, when the, when the game is uh, equal, 10-10, then we give very fast the penalties, and then the players, they won't understand why we change a way of, of uh, whistling. So I think that certainly the coach will be very, attentive of, on the consistency of the referee. Alors, there I can challenge you is that being consistent all along the game, it's already difficult, but where we are challenged here uh, amongst, uh, in, the, in the Belgian Championship, and I think it's the same everywhere, it's the consistency between all the different referees. Uh, I think it's up to a certain point we can level off the technical knowledge from all the referees, but there's a moment. How do you explain that from one game to the other game, you will have a, a different interpretation on the same phase by different referees? And can we accept that? Referee, it's part of the game. And uh, it's the same difference between two referees as you have the same difference between two packs or two scrum half or, or two uh, uh, backs. Uh, everybody has its own personality. Of course, we must try to have the same frame of the same pictures on scrum, <laughs> on line outs, and on breakdowns. But um, there is only one referee who will referee that very game. So maybe if you change the referee by another one, they will whistle the same things. Or maybe they will be different because they have their own personality. But oh, it's the cool. same if you have a scrum. You expect to have the all drops to be the, as strong as possible, but some are weak, some are stronger, some are more technical. So we are human body, we are human people, and so it's part of the game. So we, we understand that we can all level off 
but there there's a moment where the style of the referee is coming into uh, into the game and we we want that because if not well we would just do remote refereeing from a chair on the side of the pitch you as a coach what was the discourse towards your player uh, when you know that you would have this referee or this referee what's the main overall message that you give back to your players um as a coach, I am a referee and a coach. And so I will never, first of all, I will never accept any strong critique on the referee on the pitch. If we have a problem with a referee, the captain really calm, he has the opportunity to come and ask to the referee why he did whistle on that way. And from his ans the answer of the referee, he can talk to his player and adapt their game to what the referee wants. So sometimes, of course, I see that referee, I think he's strong in the line out. He, 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 he whistled quick. Or, but what I say to the players, you play your own game. And if you don't do mistakes, the referee won't whistle. If your support is on the right time, there won't be a, ch a, a chance for the opposite team to contest the ball. So do your job. And if you're not happy with the decision of, of, a, of a referee, very calmly and with respect, you, the captain can go and ask. And from the answer, you will adapt your game. And so if you say that the, if you know that the referee is not comfortable with the contest of the ball, don't contest the rex. Don't go with your hands. You can go with pushing or, OK, let the rug go and be strong on the next different situation but adapt yourself, don't go against the referee, try to understand his philosophy and try to adapt yourself. Okay, thanks. I'm a bit uh, looking at the time now. Michel, you want to in intervene? Yes, we have, a, we have a question from uh, Davide. He's asking, should we be more severe when a tackler holds or stops the ball carrier by pulling his t-shirt or pulling the arm or wrists, often seen with the, with the ladies? Yeah. I would say it depends on the situation, but of course, if you see that the tackle first can be dangerous, if you, if you pull the t-shirt or if you pull the arm, you bring it very dangerously, it can be first, it, it can come in the, in, the, in, the, in the kind of dangerous tackle, that's for, that's for sure. Um, every situation can be difficult, but if as a referee, you have a bad feeling about a tackle, you can whistle and then you can give an explanation. So. Uh, um, you can decide even to restart if you're not sure of yourself maybe with a with a scrum it depends on the level of the game but if you're not comfortable and you want a moment to discuss with a, with a team with a captain you say I don't want that kind of tackle so you can act you can penalize and you certainly must explain why you you whistle and uh, but you must trust your your feeling if you're not feeling confident with the tackle you whistle and you explain that this is a dangerous tackle for you. Okay. okay. Thank you. So let's move. We are uh, a bit late already and still a lot of things to, to look at. So like, let's say, have, have a look at the other actor now, the Bogle Kaya, which is brought, so the tackle one, and let's see what's happening on the ground. It's slow and patient build-up. From that to Hevelin, to Ember, and now to Tapper. Tapper puts on the hammer, puts on the gas. Gets up and goes, but didn't release the ball. And there's just no way through so this much wall. Speed is unreal. Here you go. Tepper tried to go straight up. Blue 14, it in the 15. Air there by Mayaki. He's Blue been 14, 15. And right there, she just needed to release the whole ball up before up she up got up. up. Same rules, Dad. So it's a, it's a, sometimes it's a notion that uh, that we have few times in the game. It's the, the the thing where the referee is calling not held. Once again, John, I think the barrier between being held and not held sometimes on some tackles is quite difficult to judge. What do you 
what what, what do you uh, favoring in this pers perspective most difficult is to be on the right position to see correctly if the person was held or not on the floor um, if you see that there was some space the, 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 the ball carrier was not held let them go let that person play but if you you really have the feeling that the tackler held the ball carrier the first the only duty maybe from the ball carrier is to free the ball so mm -hmm. Uh, and when I say to free the ball, Im immediately. So we don't allow anymore to ramp or to roll on yourself. To, to, to. Why do the players do that, to ramp or to roll on themselves? Because they want, they wait, they're waiting for the support who is too far. So the time you're rolling, the support is there. So you, you can secure the ball. So yeah. if, if, the, if the tackler did his job correctly, it, he brought you on the floor, he released you, what the ball carrier has to do is to free the ball immediately. Those are the laws. Great. Now we're going to see a video. Uh, I think that's uh, one of the most uh, disputed and uh, discussed uh, items on this very particular phase, and then we'll talk about it. In possession. Tackle, fellas. Tackle. Good work. Thanks. Bill Heavy there. It's Hosea. So that's the famous knee on the ground and, and, and the referee asking for it. Uh, how do you referee that? And I know it's maybe a, a, a bit dangerous to go on this side, but how do you differentiate that with a mole jump? This is a, a tricky uh, question. <laughs> and you must understand why that situation with the knee on the front comes from. It certainly happens more in the seventh game, where the support is, is, uh, is far. So it's to avoid the situation where we have a, uh, a ball carrier that has been held, and then the situation doesn't move, because sometimes the players, they don't want to come on support, because they, need, they have the whole field to cover. So if the ball carrier goes with his knee on the floor, then we consider that as a tackle. So it comes from the seven, and that happens a lot in seven. I have the opportunity to referee, to referee in seven, and it, it happens a lot. In rugby 15, the support is there in the second. So as a ball carrier, or you think you can go through, and you go through, or you realize immediately that you will be held, and then you must try to reach the, the ground immediately, as soon as possible. But normally, in the theory, as soon as you have a support, we have a more. And if you go with your knee on the floor, that means that uh, the more can't go on and you lose the, the scrub. All right? So here, you really, in the first situation, you realize that the referee has said, uh, tackle, and then, oh, thank you, good job. So because he knew that if he didn't say tackle, he would have a very messy situation. And it was maybe almost a mole, but he said the tackle and the defense, they let go so we could have some continuity. Mm -hmm. And then the referee said, thank you guys, good job. Because he knew that if they didn't do that, he would have a messy situation. So it's a balance. Sometimes, okay, it's, the mole is not totally formed by one support, so you can say tackle. And if the tackler released the, the tackle player, then we can have some continuity. But be, be careful because with one support, normally it becomes a mole. And if you go with a knee on the floor, then you lose the scrum. So it comes from the rugby seven. In the rugby 15, it really doesn't happen very often. Uh, I, 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 we heard twice, and I really like that. The referee uh, verbally rewarding and thanking the, the player to have a positive action. Uh, how, how do you see that? Do you like that? And uh, as a player, would you be receptive to such positive uh, message? I, I try to do that a lot. And I think, it's, as you say, it's, it's teamwork. It's not the referee against the players. We have to, 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 to work together. Uh, sometimes when I start a, a scrum, and the, the scrum before was very good, before we restart, I talk to the props and I say, guys, 
I appreciate the previous uh, scrum. Let's do that again because we have some stability. And uh, so it was a good confrontation, but in the laws. Thank you guys. Let's do that again. So I think we must reward and it gives some indication to the players how is our personality and what we like in the rugby. And I think most of the referees like to have some continuity. Excellent. Thanks. Let's move uh, forward now with the. Uh, doesn't work again. I think it's next slide. So the big debate of this year, the jackler, the first arriving player, we have seen that uh, World Rugby gave new indication on how to apply the existing law. Before we, we start and look at some video, uh, has this new interpretation has an impact on the way you referee yourself to the breakdown? Um, I like the new indication because I used to play a, a flanker and uh, I, was that, I was that very strong uh, player to, to break a wall or to, but I was technically good as being a jackler and to, and to grab some balls. So I like that technique part of the rugby and I like to reward uh, a jackler when he does that in the, in the correct situation. When he's strong on his position, he, he carries his body weight and he releases the ball and then he grabs the ball and he can be strong on his position. I think we should reward. And I like the fact that uh, what will be give now an opportunity to, to challenge that and to have a, a new opportunity to contest the ball uh, beside of uh, scrum and, uh, and line out. So I think it's good. And of course, um, it rewards the jackler, so the guy in strong position. And of course, it penalizes the slow support. If you're not good and not quick enough in support, you don't deserve the ball. I think it's going the right direction. Okay, so let's have a look at some video. Go to runners for Australia, and inside the 22 they go again. Ready, Boyle. Ireland with Best the man in. All right. Good still. Three on feet. Yeah, quite good in this area, Ireland. But have a look. Just once again, it's the kind of power that Australia had going in there. But look at that. The <laughs> Finally, the penalty. Yeah, this that one again. He's been absolutely inspired, Jimmy Ritchie. Look at downfield. Got a way up. Look at that there. Straight on the ball. Absolutely brilliant. The number seven. He has been good tonight. Again, Hunter getting over the game line. And quick ball for a scrum half to use. McLean once more. And a switch for Furford in the middle. Well tackled by Anari. France having to realign and just hold the defensive shape down to get the penalty. Not releasing on the ground. Six blue on their feet. It's a, a decent touch just inside the England half, but here we have a look at it again. You can see Burford getting turned and look at that. Anna Re in on our feet. Just hold that. Yeah, definitely seven for France, wasn't it? Not six for France. That's Anna Re. Good work with the breakdown for her. France showing they're not moving. Into the arms of Paul Latour. Donald Lockhart, clear. He's going to be the work of Patea. He's a threat, he's creative. We'll see the turnover eventually here. This was Michael Hooper got in and stole it. It's a great steal. Tackle in there from Van der Flair. Ducking down there is New Year. Good turnover. Oh, what a turnover as well. Lorna. Johnny Sexton was outstanding while he was on the field, went off in the 50th minute. But the man of the match for me this evening has been the attacking force. Uh, John, we, we see in all these things that, okay, naturally it's a perspective from the video, we are not on the pitch, but when you look at some of the game currently taking place in the South uh, Hemisphere, uh, New Zealand, Argentina, it goes extremely quick and it's extremely difficult to have coherence and to really identify who is doing what. Have you ever had a, a, a doubt on anything happening? And Okay, finally, you just let it go without it knowing or having the feeling that maybe you missed something. Can this happen in a game? If we don't have doubt as a referee, that means that we, we should stop being referee. Um, we have to work uh, very hard on every situation. And I think what will help a referee to take the good decision 
is to be there on the breakdown situation. If you're very close, you see what's happening. And even you said that, even the video is too far. The video doesn't give you the right timing. What I like about that phase, it's the timing. How smart the players they are to analyze the situation, to be and quick in the right, right timing and with such a nice technique. It's probably the most difficult movement to do in the rugby game is to be a good jackler and to do the turnover on the correct way. So I think as a referee, it's being there to analyze if he has the time to release the ball carrier, but if he could do his movement of contest the ball before the support arrives. And the only way for a referee to analyze that situation correctly is to be there on time. Okay, thanks. So now let's have a look at what's happening quite a lot. It's the way the jackler is behaving and the way he's supporting his body weight in his action. The first offense. Right. pulls out, lifted. <laughs> and carries. Right. Another penalty by Ireland. Again, it's off feet. And again, it's a bit of a needless one, Mel. Yeah, the defense was right up there. And there's Malloy. She didn't support her body weight in the slightest, and that's why she gave away that penalty. If she had been upright, and gone for the ball, it would have been a different story because she was in great position there. Adams on the outside for Wales. Adams! Tackled by Hale at Petty. Another, or rather, a penalty to Wales. He breaks a tackle, but then watch Adam Archie Cooper. He gets back. He gets over the ball. His hands are on the ground. I thought he was a little bit unlucky there to be penalised, but his hands are on the ground before he goes back onto the ball. So he's off his feet. So it's quite, once again, very difficult to see what's a good behavior, what's it's a wrong behavior. Uh, do you think players are maybe behaving differently if we get, if, the, if in the defense we are getting closer to their trying light? One trick for the referee and for the players. If you can't support your own body weight, you will land on your elbows. Probably on that moment, it's too, it's, uh, too late. So the only thing the players can do is let go. If he tried to contest the ball after it has been landed on his elbow, it means that probably he will be fault. And some of the times, sometimes, it's not his fault. It's sometimes he's on supporting his body weight, but it's support, defense support. They want to help grabbing or to push, and they push him. And so he lands on the wreck. So he didn't do on purpose, but on that moment, the only thing he has to do it's to let go, otherwise he will be penalized. And choose communication and res responding to what the referee is asking you to do can allow avoiding penalty kicks, certainly, as you explained. We will see the jackler trying to get the ball. Don't but we will see, of course, if he is, if he is pushed by one of his teammates. So we know he didn't do on purpose. So on that moment, if we say, roll away, and immediately he leaves the ball, we will let it let go. But if he stays stuck on that ball and certainly close from his try line, he can get a, a he will certainly get a penalty and a yellow card because his intention is to slow down the ball. So once everything happened, when you have understood everything, you clarified anything, then comes the second phase, which is the formation of the wreck. So uh, just a, a recall of the definition: uh, what's a wreck? The actors. Uh, what's again, it, it's, it's sometimes extremely difficult to identify when is a wreck, who can participate, who can do what, and, and let's have a look at some video and discuss around the video. So we're near to the gate, clearly from the side. Well done, Josh Adams. Jake Paul again. Penalty to France.
So here we are talking about the notion that we, we could have discussed a bit before. It's the question of entering the gate and this notion of dimension of the gate. Do you think this is the directive from this year from World Rugby to identify clearly who is coming from the side, yes or no? Do you think that the clarification has helped you this year to identify really who we can let come? Yes, because um, if you see the video, Philip, that you did in September, you, you see clearly some arriving players who are really on the side, so they don't do the effort to come through the gate or parallel to the line out lines, but they come really on the side. And why they do that? It's because they're too short on timing. If they, if they, if they don't come on the side, it means that the support will be too late and the ball will be contested by the, by the jackler. So you have always a consequences from an act. Why they act like this? It's because they're too late. So if you, as a referee, so you must be very close from the situation to analyze the tackle, but then take a little bit of backward situation to analyze the whole uh, uh, breakdown situation, and then you realize which are the forces. And of course, if you see you have a jackler in very strong position that will contest the ball, and then somebody arriving on the side, why is he doing that? It's because it's too late. So he will try to, to save the ball. So... Uh, every action of players has consequences, uh, consequences and uh, they have origins. So we have to think about why he does that. So it's very clear, I think. Coming on the side, it's a penalty. Once again, we hear sometimes uh, referee calling ruck. Uh, do you do that systematically? And in fact, when you are calling a ruck, what do you expect as a behavior from the players? When we so we certainly don't have to say rock on each rock, otherwise we say that more than 100 times a game. Why we do that is because we think the players are supposed to know that when a referee says rock, all kind of obligation and duties come from that. There are outside lines, they have to join the rock through the gate, there is no hands in the rock, there is, they, they can't kick in the ball, um, uh, we have outside lines position, so every kind of obligation and responsibilities come from the word rock. And if we say that, it's also to help the players. So it clarifies. It's no more tackle, it's now a rock. That means you can't go with the hands. So if we say that when there is a possibility of doubt in the mind of the players, so, to, so there is no doubt anymore, we say rock. And so normally the players, they know what they have to do. Okay, I'm a bit mindful of the time. It's almost a uh, time, but we, we still have to discuss a few things. Let's have a look at some nice, great example of counter wreck. We have to leave it at, with all we to a precision in the second half. Oh, once again. That's a good counter wreck. Counter wreck is good. Finn Russell. Excellent work by one of the smallest players on the Scottish side. Scotland back in possession, a chance to launch their own counter attack. So the counter wreck does not happen so often, but it's still a good and great illustration of the of the of the combat, in fact, over the ball. When do you consider a counter wreck is effective, yes or not? When the when the defender, they went over the ball. And so the, the defensive line has moved from one point to another one. Uh, and you can hear the referee say, oh, that was a good counter -ruck. Why he says that? It's also to help the players, to clarify the situation. So the ball was from white, now the ball is in the blue position. position. So he knows that from there, maybe the defending, the defense will be placed on the right way. They know they have to defend instead of attack. And I think uh, John is gone. Ah, oh, no, there you are. Can you hear us, John? Yes? Yes, yes. Ah, okay, that's right, because you were just cut for a moment. Oh, sorry. Uh, on the bright. Patchel. Let's Patchel. have a look Patchel. now at the, the positioning. There's two, two perspectives I like. I to, to talk with you. It's first the role of the assistant. It's absolutely evident that there are many things to look at in this phase. We have to look at not only the, uh, the constitution of the work, what's 
what's happening there. We have to look at the offside. How do you possibly use your assistant to help you in this in this perspective? Um, it, it depends who they are. So we, we work as a family, work as a team, as a, as the players. So if I know them very well, I can ask them more things than if I, it's the first time I refer with the assistant referee. So we come from the base and then I ask them more and more things to do. On here, you can see that the referee will use the assistant referee mm -hmm. to help himself where is the offside, uh, the offline position. So he, if there is one of the, the, the blue players who is in front of his referee, then he knows that he is offside. Probably he has a, 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 a communication system, so he will maybe focus on the defense close from the ruck and his assistant referee, what they will do, they will tell him if there is, of course, a player offside, but they will certainly prevent the offside by telling the players, oh, on a winger, get back, get back. So all the way of uh, being a referee with his assistant and the communication is to prevent most of the fault. We are not rewarded by the number of, number of penalty we whistle. We are rewarded if we can have the more continuity on the game. Do, would you ask, or do you think it's, use, it's in, useful to ask an assistant to emit a judgment on what's happening on the ground, or the breakdown is your job, and his job is to check the line out, whatever happens? Yeah. We asked the, 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 we, we ask the assistant referee to help us first to look what's happening in the back, in our back. So when we leave a rough situation, we as a referee, we must be on the neck tackle situation. So we leave a situation maybe with 12 players involved together, uh, they push and stuff. So security and safety will be their job, looking what's happening in our back situation. Then on the breakdown situation, because we are the closest, we must manage ourselves and take the decision ourselves. But they can help us with the position of the players and they can help us with seeing something happening on the other side of the rug. By example, a hand in ruck. If we are standing left of the ruck and there is a hand in ruck on the right side, they can help us because on that moment they can see what happens. Okay, very clear. Now let's talk about your positioning. There are many positions where we can stand. Or maybe Michel, you want to ask a question. I see you want to intervene. Well, we have a question, but it's more about the situation before. Uh, a question from Patrick, who's asking us. And if you see the refereeing in the professional professional games, it appears that they allow the supporting players arriving to stand on their hand and feet as long they are not really laying down on the player. How strictly do you referee that bitching over the ball? It's all about every... Uh, it will be difficult to give a clear answer. Mm. It depends on each situation. It depends also on the level of the game. Belgian referee, we cannot apply what we see on television. It's the same way as the players. They they don't do the same. They don't play the same sport as what we we watch on television. It goes quicker. The impact are stronger. They're professional. They know what they do. And uh, the on TV rugby must be also a, a, a TV show. So um, what you have to consider first of all is the safety of the player. If he's on his on his hand and feet, and it can be dangerous for himself, and it can slow down the, the, the ball, then you can penalize him. So it depends on the situation. If there are a lot of support around the players, is he alone? So uh, it's a balance. He must trust himself, and he must see what are the consequences of the act of the player. Is he playing on the ground? Is he releasing the ball? Is he slowing down the game? Those are all questions that will help him to, to, give, to take the right decision. In fact, okay. if I may hide, basically, he has to see how much the behavior of this player will stop the contest on the opposition around the ball. Yeah. If no one is there, no one is contesting, that's maybe something you can let go. But as from the moment that two players, uh, two opponents are there over the ball and in position to contest, well, at the end, you, you have to give the same chance from both sides. And the first one that would infringe would be potentially the, the one we would, con we would penalize. So back on, on, on this, uh, and that would be the last point for tonight, John, positioning of the referee. We see them quite a lot 
in different position uh, that that's what we call the, the um, how do you call this one when they are uh, mostly on the back the jockey uh, yeah, the jockey position, merci. Uh, some of them are being in the defense. Some of them are turning their back to the defense. What's the best? Uh, what do you advise? And why are they all moving like that? Um, I would say jockey position is a good position because you can see what's happening in the ruck and you can try with your hand to control the defense. But of course, if you have some problem with offside of the line, of the line you must change position and come with your body in front of the defense position. So you must adapt your position on how the, the players react. If you have some teams who are very well disciplined and they stay behind the offside line, you can use the body, the jockey position because you can see almost all the game. But if you must control more the offside position, you must come close from the defense and so you can move on each uh, ruck from position, from jockey to close to the defense. So as the players, they adapt their game on your referee, as a referee, you must adapt the position on how the players play. So here we are, it's uh, 10 past nine, that was the last slide. I think it's, it's evident that uh, while it's very disputed uh, phase and uh, we are discussing a lot on how the referee, we have seen it again this weekend on the uh, England-France game, uh, and while we can imagine that Ole Ferry can come to a certain level and understanding of the phase, there will still be a lot of interpretation, despite some recommendation from World Rugby, and we will still have the style of the referee that's coming, uh, coming into play, which in the other way make as well a bit the beauty of this sport, otherwise we would be uh, playing rugby behind the PlayStation. So, John, thanks a lot for all this intervention, that was very interesting, I hope everyone learned a lot and Michel now the floor is yours if you wish to conclude well the only thing I would like to add is uh, thank you very much uh, Philippe Len, John Cato for uh, introducing us in the black arts of the tackle and, uh, and the assistant tacklers I, I think it was a very interesting session um, and some good points to take away from so um, back again uh, both thank you for this uh, nice session and hope we can uh, see each other uh, soon back on the on the real pitch and not in front of our uh, cameras and uh, computers yeah exactly thanks a lot good evening good evening michel and john bonsoir à tous bye bye bye